All right, so we're going to be going over COPD today. So I'll go ahead and get started in a second. I just really quickly wanted to thank everybody for the comments. Um, I've seen that a lot of people are actually taking their pants and, and sending me messages that they're passing, and I'm so happy to hear that. So congrats, and good luck to the people who are going to be taking their pants in the next few weeks. I know there's a lot of people right now that are scheduled and, and ones that already have, so I know the waiting game is terrible, too, when you take it and you're waiting for your results. But good luck to everybody. Um, let's go ahead and get started. But thank you again for all the comments. And please subscribe if you haven't yet because I'm releasing videos now pretty much every week. So let's go ahead and get started with COPD. Uh, COPD, obviously, is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it's a progressive disease, pulmonary disease. And the key here is that it's not fully reversible. So that differentiates it from asthma, which generally is most of the time. Um, so it's a progressive pulmonary disease, not fully reversible. Um, it's characterized by a combination of a couple different things, but it's a small airway disease and you also have parenchymal destruction. Um, the structural changes we see in COPD, like narrowing of airway, destruction of alveoli, lead to airflow limitation, mucociliary dysfunction, which we'll see in chronic bronchitis, and a number of clinical manifestations that you need to be aware of that we'll go over in a few minutes. So there's two forms of COPD, it's emphysema and chronic bronchitis. To be you know, for the sake of accuracy, there's technically a third subset known as uh, chronic obstructive asthma. It's not on your pants blueprint. It's not very common and it's not important for you to know. So obviously we're just going to focus on emphysema and chronic bronchitis, what you need to know for your boards and for real life, because this is mainly what you're going to be seeing out there when we talk about COPD. So COPD affects more than 5% of the population, and it actually has a very high morbidity and mortality rate. It's the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. So you want to be familiar with how to treat these patients because um, this is a very serious condition. So let's go ahead and get started with emphysema. We'll break down each individual one, the things that I feel like you really need to know. So emphysema, all about the alveoli when we're talking about patho. It's a permanent destruction of the alveoli, which leads to this enlargement of terminal air spaces. The damage we see is on the alveolar walls, the capillary surface of the alveoli, which results in a loss of surface area available for oxygen exchange. So we can take a look here what that actually looks like. You see a normal alveoli. Um, you have all of the surface area, all the walls of the alveoli. So all this extra surface area means extra area for oxygen absorption. We take a look at emphysema, which has damage to the alveoli, and basically they just pop, and you have this wide open space here. You lose all of the all of the walls you see here for oxygen absorption. So you have a, a problem absorbing oxygen, and it's a diffusing problem. Um, so this causes not only a problem with um, absorbing oxygen, but it also leads to a loss of elastic recoil and airway collapse. So this is important because the, a lot of the symptoms these patients have are because of this. So due to alveolar destruction, damage to the lung parenchyma, we see in emphysema, these patients are going to have what's known as air trapping and difficulty with expiration. So if you think about blowing up a balloon, you blow it up, then you let it go, and the, the air automatically snaps back out. It has elastic recoil. It's the same idea in the lungs. When you take in a deep breath, there's no effort to exhale. The air just comes out. But in a patient with uh, emphysema, it actually be, exhalation actually becomes this active process because they lose that elastic recoil and they actually have to push. And you, we'll, you'll, we'll talk about something later on known as um, purse lip breathing, which actually helps them to exhale. But um, the consequence of all of this damage to the alveoli and the, the lung parenchyma is going to be this air trapping and retention of CO2. So they have trouble with exhalation, which is key for emphysema for you to know. Now, etiologies, there's really only two that you need to know. The big one is going to be smoking. By far, that's your most common cause, um, not only in emphysema, but in chronic bronchitis as well. And then the second unique one that you need to know, it's much less common. It's actually a genetic cause of emphysema, and it's called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I'm not going to go too deep into this, but just understand that if you see a vignette and it describes a young patient, no history of smoking that's developed emphysema, right away you should be thinking alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's as deep as you need to go with this. You really don't need to know much else about it. That's really all you need to focus on for your vignettes. Young patient, non-smoker, they have emphysema, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So remember smoking and then your genetic causes. Now there's a couple different types. There's actually three types, but there's really only two that you need to be familiar with as far as, far as the, the exams and things that you need to know. So there's one known as central lobular, and central lobular is going to be seen with um, cigarette smoking, with patients who smoke. So if you see, they say, what is the most common type of emphysema in a smoker? Central lobular. The way that you remember that, C, central lobular, C, cigarette smoking. And then the second one is known as panlobular or panacenar. 
And this one is most commonly seen in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So the way that I remember that, I have this visual that I've never forgotten. I remember panlobular or panacean or emphysema. Think of a pan, steaks cooking in a pan, and then you're pouring some A1 steak sauce over the pan, over the steaks. A1, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, pan cooking steaks, panlobular, A1 steak sauce, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. I promise you if you have a vignette and they say what type of condition is most common in panlobular emphysema, you will not forget that visual, and that's my goal here. So hopefully that's the case at least. So those two types, again, central lobular smoking, panlobular, uh, or panacinar is going to be alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's all you need to know for the types. Now, history and exam, let's find out how these patients are going to present, what we're going to hear in auscultation. So they're definitely going to have dyspnea. It's a classic finding in emphysema. Initially, it's just going to be with exertion, but eventually as it progresses, these patients are going to even going to have dyspnea at rest. They're going to have trouble even speaking full sentences. And remember, you're looking for that prolonged expiration. You won't miss um, a patient in real life actually seeing these patients. It's pretty dramatic um, how significant the dyspnea is and, and the exhalation and everything. Um, and then they also have something which I went over briefly before known as pursed lip breathing. So this is actually a compensatory mechanism that patients with emphysema um, begin to do. And what it does is it prevents the airway from collapsing. And it does this by increasing air pressure when they actually blow out with pursed lips, they increase the air pressure in the alveoli and the airway, and it keeps the alveoli from collapsing, at least temporarily, and it makes expiration easier for them. So you're going to see this pursed lip breathing. And then also another key here is that they're generally going to be non-cyanotic. They're not going to have cyanosis, mild hypoxemia, and this is compared to chronic bronchitis, which has very severe hypoxemia, cyanosis. Um, so patients with emphysema will have um, matched VQ defects, unlike in chronic bronchitis where there's a VQ mismatch. So the body um, with patients with emphysema actually compensates to the damage by the alveoli by decreasing cardiac output, increasing the respiratory rate, and it helps stabilize the VQ defect that they have. So you won't see it as severe um, hypoxemia in these patients. I'm not going to go too deep into that because I don't think it's important enough, but just be aware that the VQ mismatch in patients with emphysema is matched, unlike chronic bronchitis where there's a mismatch. So you're not going to see um, very severe hypoxemia or cyanosis. Um, but actually, the compensatory mechanisms that leads to this actually leads to some other problems um, because of the low cardiac output. These patients are often going to appear thin, cachectic, like very uh, emaciated. So that's a, a consequence of, the, of the, the compensatory mechanism here. So another thing that you need to know is that pursed lip breathing and non-cyanosis or non-cyanotic is what's going to lead to the, the saying you may have heard of, of emphysema patients, which is known as a pink puffer. So the reason they're described as a pink puffer, we can take a look here. This is a patient with emphysema. This is a patient with chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is known as um, blue bloaters, and emphysema patients are known as pink puffers. The reason they're known as pink puffers, they're non-cyanotic. So you see the blue mucous membranes here, the nails. Um, so that's a blue bloater. And then he has edema, which we'll go over later. But emphysema here, you can see him puffing out his lips. So puffer and then pink because of the skin color, non-cyanotic. And sometimes it'll be a little bit more red because of the hyperventilation. So pink puffer is because, again, purse lip breathing and they're non-cyanotic. Now, they're also going to have an increased AP diameter, also known as a barrel chest. And this is basically just because they have all of this retained air. They have air trapping, uh, again, due to the loss of elastic recoil. So their lungs and their chest are just going to be really broad. and They're going to have increased a AP diameter or a barrel chest. And remember, that's why in your OSCEs, you always check the AP diameter. It's basically for emphysema or other causes like this, but that you'll see this in these patients. It can be pretty dramatic at times, this barrel chest they develop. Now, as far as when you're actually um, auscultating the lungs and listening, what you're going to hear on these patients is going to be absent or decreased breath sounds and hyper resonance to percussion. So remember, hyper resonance to percussion is um, if you imagine like if you puff out your cheek and you tap on it, it's the same noise you'll hear with patients with emphysema. So think about it, you puff out your cheek, your air, your cheek is full of air. Well, what's going on in the, the chest or the, the thoracic cavity of a patient with emphysema? It's full of air. They have all this retained air. So it's the same thing when you actually percuss, you're going to hear hyperresonance. Same way with your cheek that's full of air. And that's the same reason why you have absent or decreased breath sounds. 
Think about when you're listening to a patient that has a pneumothorax, all of that air that's escaped. So all that air is filling the cavity and you have absent or decreased breath sounds, same thing here. It's just full of air. And that's why on auscultation, you're gonna hear hyperresonance and absent or decreased breath sounds. Um, so remember that the way I used to remember it, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but it kind of helped me. So emphysema, I remembered empty, like the lungs were empty because in chronic bronchitis, it's a completely different story in auscultation. Um, but I remember empty because it's empty because it's just full of air, like big, broad, open, wide, full of air. And that's why you have these symptoms. So I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but it, it helped me to kind of remember the auscultatory findings in these patients. Okay. So moving on to diagnosis, the main way to diagnose your gold standard test for patients with not only emphysema, but COPD is going to be a pulmonary function test. So this is going to be your best way to test for COPD. So use your PFT. So all this is, um, it's just, you have a patient breathe into a spirometer and then you measure their exhalation. You measure two different things. You're going to measure both um, FEV1 and then FEC, and you're going to do a ratio of these two. Now, when you actually do the calculation between FEV1 and FEC, less than 70 is going to be indicative of COPD or emphysema. Um, and basically FEV1 is just your forced expiratory volume. It's how much air you can exhale in one second. And then your FEC, which is your, um, is your forced vital capacity. That's just going to be the amount of air you can get out of the lungs um, after you taking a full deep breath and then you blow all the way out as much as you can get out. That's your FEC. So what you do is you divide the two and then the ratio that you get, if it's less than 70, this is again going to be indicative of uh, emphysema or COPD. You're going to see this in chronic bronchitis as well. So this is really the key here. This is your best test um, for COPD is that um, is your pulmonary function test. Now, another key here, and this is going to what's going to differentiate emphysema from um, chronic bronchitis is something known as DLCO. So DLCO is going to be low or decreased in emphysema. It's going to be normal in chronic bronchitis. So DLCO, I can show you just so you can take a look here. It's a test that measures the diffusing capacity of the lungs for carbon monoxide. Um, we all know in emphysema that there's alveolar destruction. It decreases the gas exchange surface, and this is going to lead to diffusing capacity of the lungs. And that's why we see decreased DLCO and emphysema. Um, normal and chronic bronchitis where there's not alveolar destruction. So you see here, this actually has um, CO2 gas that's blown into the mouth here. You take in a deep breath and then you blow it out and then it measures how much is actually retained by the lungs. So that's a DLCO test. Again, it's going to be decreased in emphysema because the lungs aren't diffusing properly and normal in chronic bronchitis because the chronic bronchitis, there's no alveolar destruction. So remember, this is the key to differentiate. If you have a vignette, they say it's less than 70%. And you don't know is it chronic bronchitis or emphysema? Look for the DLCO test, and that'll help you. Um, chest X-ray, it's not really going to be, um, you know, that sensitive or specific, but it is a good test for a couple different findings. It's a good initial test that you can do. Um, so there's a couple things you're going to be looking for. So in a chest X-ray, you're going to have a flattened diaphragm in patients with um, emphysema. So the diaphragm is weakened from chronic airflow limitation, the hyperventilation. It's going to tax the respiratory muscles. And then eventually the, the diaphragm will break down and it's going to lead to this flattening. And we can take a look at that here. You can see the flattening of the diaphragm here and here. And then on the lateral chest x-ray, we can see it here as well. So flattened diaphragms and emphysema. And then the other one, which is really more um, specific here, is going to be bullet. So bullet, we'll take a look here. You can actually see the edge of the bullet here. You can see another one up here, also on the side here. These red arrows aren't actually um, emphysema. It's just showing that the, the lungs are over aerated. So just look at the white arrows here. Can you see the edge of the bullet? This is the easiest one to see here. So all bullet is, um, it's these area in the lungs that form. They're classified as one plus centimeter diameter air filled space um, that due to emphysematous destruction of the lung parenchyma, you have these alveoli that are damaged. And like in the first diagram I showed you, instead of those multiple grape-like alveoli, you're going to have this massive space of just empty dead space. And then you're going to get these large pockets of air. So those are known as bullae, and it's definitely very specific for emphysema. Now you can do a CT and you can see them much better. You can see a CT here. This is bullae, bullae, bullae. I mean, you can't miss it on CT. It's much easier to see. So this is all related to, to emphysema and these large pockets of air that form because of all the destruction to the alveoli. 
So CT is going to be more sensitive and specific. Um, this will be a better test for emphysema, but you can do a chest X-ray initially, especially when you're, you know, gathering some some history and doing some tests to diagnose a patient with emphysema initially. Remember, your PFTs is going to be your best test if they ask you what the gold standard is. Okay, so let's move on to chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis, we actually have to know a little definition of what this is compared to emphysema. So chronic bronchitis is going to be a chronic productive cough for at least three months a year for two consecutive years. And then the key here is, is you rule out other causes of a chronic cough, like bronchiectasis and other things. So again, um, chronic productive cough for, th or for three months a year for two consecutive years in a patient who other, uh, other chronic causes of cough have been excluded. Now, the, the main thing that you're gonna see in chronic bronchitis patients, the, the key here is this overproduction and hypersecretion of mucus that's um, stimulated by the goblet cells that's in response to chronic inflammation. So these patients have been smoking for a number of years, bronchioles are constantly dilated, and eventually the goblet cells just start to produce all of this mucus and it causes all of these obstructive problems in patients with chronic bronchitis. So that's really the key. Remember, in emphysema, it was all about the alveoli destruction, chronic bronchitis, it's all about the excess mucus and inflammation that these patients have. Etiologies, really just one you need to know here, smoking, absolutely the most common cause. Um, it can be from exposure to toxins, air pollutions, but overall it's smoking. That's really all you need to know as far as etiologies when it comes to chronic bronchitis. Now history and exam, there's a few um, key findings that we'll see in, in auscultation, so let's go over that. Now, the main thing here is that chronic productive cough, sputum production, that's the key with these patients. And they're also going to be cyanotic. So remember in emphysema, they were generally non-cyanotic. Why are they cyanotic in chronic bronchitis? So they have that poor ventilation we went over. They have difficulty getting air through these congested inflamed bronchioles, and it's going to lead to um, alveolar hypoxia because you're not getting enough air in. It's not that there's anything wrong with the alveoli, just not getting enough air in. So the way the body tries to compensate for this is by doing the opposite of emphysema. So there, it's going to decrease ventilation and increase cardiac output. So this creates a really bad VQ mismatch. You're getting all this blood to this um, poorly ventilated lungs, um, and it goes on long enough that these patients actually develop hypercapnia, respiratory acidosis, and you're going to go down a path here. So because of everything that happens with the bad VQ mismatch, the hypoxia, the respiratory acidosis, now what's going to happen is you're going to have vasoconstriction of the pulmonary vasculature. And if you remember when we went over heart failure and those types of things, when you have um, pulmonary hypertension or vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature, what's going to happen to the right side of the heart? Right side's pushing against all of this pressure in the lungs. It's going to lead to heart failure. They're going to have um, all of these right-sided heart failure symptoms now. And that's the key. That's the reason they're going to be cyanotic. And that's also the reason they're going to have edema. Um, these are key findings in patients with chronic bronchitis that you're generally not going to see with emphysema. Something else that I want to mention as well, just for the sake of real life, is that often emphysema and chronic bronchitis are not two separate entities. They're often um, seen together. So many times you're going to have patients that have a little bit of both. So for the sake of the exam, it's nice and easy to separate them. And generally that's how it'll present in a vignette, but know for real life that these can easily coexist. So a lot of these things that I'm mentioning, know that for the test, this is how it's gonna be presented, but you need to know real life too. A lot of times these patients will actually have both. So just know that. Anyways, let's focus again for our test minds and focus on the, the key findings of chronic bronchitis. So cyanosis edema. Again, this edema is now because of the right-sided heart failure. They have um, pulmonary hypertension. Now the right side of the heart's starting to fail. So you're gonna have edema. You're gonna have you know peripheral edema. You're gonna have uh, your JVP. You're gonna have all of the things we talked about in right-sided heart failure. Um, in these patients as well. And these two findings here, the cyanosis, the bluing of the lips, the, the nails, um, and edema is why these patients are known as blue bloaters, the cyanosis and the edema. So we take a look here again, you see this guy, he's more swollen, his lips are blue, his nails are blue. You can see compared to him, who's nice and skinny and pink, he's blue in the lips. Um, you can see just uh, the cyanotic appearance in his, you can see the fingernails here, and he's swollen. That's all the edema because of the right-sided heart failure. He has all this peripheral edema, and the abdomen is swollen. Um, so that's why chronic bronchitis patients are known as blue bloaters because of the edema and the cyanosis. That's the key there. Um, 
Now, in auscultation, this is going to be different than emphysema. So emphysema, remember, was empty. You, tell, you, you percussed. It was nice and loud because it was just full of air. But with chronic bronchitis patients, remember, inflammation, mucus. What are you going to hear now? You're going to hear crackles, ronchi, wheezing. Remember, these, these bronchioles are inflamed. They're full of mucus. It's going to be completely different than what you saw in emphysema with all that retained air. So now in auscultation, they're full. They're full of mucus. Their bronchioles are inflamed, so wheezing, crackles, ronchi, different than emphysema, so remember that. Okay, now his diagnosis, it's going to be the same. Um, you're going to do a pulmonary function test, and it's going to be the same finding. So decreased FEV1, decreased FEV1, FEC ratio, remember, less than 70%. I forgot to put a less than sign there, but less than 70% in patients with chronic bronchitis. So it's the same. The PFT is the same. Remember, what's the key to differentiating? It's going to be your DLCO. So it's normal because there's no alveolar disease in chronic bronchitis. The diffusing capacity of the lungs, unaffected. So the DLCO is going to be normal. That's how you're going to be able to differentiate from chronic bronchitis um, from emphysema. Another thing I wanted to mention too is that when you do your PFTs, um, these PFT findings are also going to be suggestive of asthma. A way that can help you um, differentiate is when you do a bronchodilator test. So you, um, you do your FEV1, your FEC ratio, and you see that it's less than 70%. You give them a puff of the bronchodilator, the albuterol, whatever it is, and if they don't really improve very much, this is more indicative of a, um, a non-reversible cause, like a chronic bronchitis, emphysema. If they improve dramatically, you're looking more at asthma. So that's just a little side note there in case that's brought up in the exams or on your OSCE. So remember, same findings as in emphysema, but the DLCO is going to be normal. That's the key. Now, all of the other findings are all going to be related to the right-sided heart failure and the chronic hypoxia. So on chest x-ray, enlarged right heart border, remember the right side's failing. It's becoming hypertrophy. ECG is going to show right atrial enlargement, right axis deviation. These are all right-sided heart failure um, findings. Nothing specific because you can have this from other causes of heart failure, but this is what you'll see in chronic bronchitis because of that heart failure. And then your labs, you're going to see an increased H&H &H because of the chronic bronchitis. I'm sorry, the chronic hypoxia that these patients are going to have. So main thing here is going to be your PFTs with a normal DLCO. These are all just other findings suggestive of the heart failure and the, the chronic hypoxia. I just want to do a quick chart before we move into treatment, just so we can really quickly go over the differences here. Again, emphysema, chronic bronchitis. Remember, emphysema, all about the alveoli. Chronic bronchitis is more about the mucus and the chronic inflammation. Patients with emphysema are going to have this dyspnea with pursolate breathing. Chronic bronchitis, chronic productive cough with sputum. That's the symptoms you'll see here, the main things. Emphysema, matched VQ defects, very mild hypoxia. Chronic bronchitis, blue hypoxic VQ mismatch, pretty severe VQ mismatch. Emphysema, pink puffers, thin purse breathing, non-cyanotic. Chronic bronchitis, blue bloaters, right-sided heart failure, edematose, cyanotic, obese. Remember, these can coexist, so you may see both, but remember for the exams, Generally, they're nice and they kind of separate these to make it easier for an exam question. Emphysema on auscultation, your auscultatory findings, hyperresonance, remember it's empty, it's just air in there, to percussion and then decreased or absent breath sounds, chronic bronchitis, they are full of mucus, inflammation, rails, ronchi, wheezing. So that's the differences there. You can take a little screenshot if you wanted something like that just to go over. Now let's go into treatment. So before we get into the actual medications, there's a few interventions that need to be addressed in all patients, which I'm going to go over in a second. But just know um, that outside of a lung transplant, um, there's none of these medications are going to improve lung function. There's only two things that have actually been shown to improve mortality in patients with COPD, and they're not any of the medications we're going to go over. The only two things that have proven mortality benefit in patients with COPD are going to be smoking cessation, and supplemental oxygen. Those are the only two things that actually show mortality benefit. All the other things we'll go over are going to make your patient feel better, but they're not going to improve mortality. So just know that, especially if they ask you, um, what is the most important treatment um, option for a patient with COPD? And you have all of these um, albuterol and, and all of the ipotropium, whatever it is, and they have smoking cessation, this is your answer. It's smoking cessation. This is the single most important therapeutic intervention for COPD is to get these patients to stop smoking. It's one of only two um, mortality benefit treatments. The second is going to be supplemental oxygen. So supplemental oxygen only shows mortality benefit if the patient has an O2 sat less than 88% or a PaO2, which is your partial pressure of oxygen um, measured from uh, arterial blood gas 
less than or equal to 55%. So if their O2 sets 92 and you give them oxygen, it's not going to improve their mortality benefit. It's only if they're hypoxic, O2 set less than or equal to 88%, or partial pressure of oxygen, PO2, less than or equal to 55%. So remember, these are your only two mortality benefits. And then another thing that I wanted to mention, because you'll probably hear about this, um, you have to be careful providing supplemental O2 to patients with COPD. Um, it can actually be harmful to them. So when you give them oxygen, you only want to bring their O2 set up to 92%. You're generally going to try to have them between 88 and 92%. So you wonder why, why don't I want to get their O2 set up to like 98, like a normal patient? Well, the reason is, um, so you have chemoreceptors in your body. The job of these chemoreceptors is to monitor the, the carbon dioxide levels in your body. And as soon as these chemoreceptors sense an increase in CO2, they increase your respirations to blow off excess CO2. That's the normal response in a patient. It's the same reason why when you hold your breath, you have this intense desire to breathe again. Your chemoreceptors are seeing all this excess CO2 in your body, and it's telling your body, breathe, breathe, get all the CO2 out. So that's the trigger for you to start breathing, you know, in response the way you should. When a COPD patient, they have this chronically elevated level of carbon dioxide all the time. It's normal for them. Um, and due to this, the level of carbon dioxide in the blood is no longer the trigger to tell them to breathe or change their respiratory rate. It wouldn't make sense since it's all the time for them. So instead, what the body does, um, instead of responding to CO2, it actually responds to the level of hypoxia or the lower levels of oxygen in these patients. So the idea is that these patients only respond and vary their respirations according to a lower level of oxygen. So if all of a sudden you give them this high level of O2 very fast, you bring their O2 set up to normal levels like 98%, they're, all, they're still going to have all this excess CO2 in their body, but their body's going to think um, everything's okay, and it's going to tell them to, it's going to blunt their hypoxic drive, their respirations are going to start to slow down, and it's going to lead to a consequent acidosis. They're going to start breathing extremely slow. Their body's going to do the reverse, and they're going to have this extremely slow respiration, and it can lead to acidosis. Um, so that's why you give them oxygen, improve their SAT, but only on the lower end, up to 92%. That's really the max um, so you don't turn off their hypoxic respiratory drive. Sorry, I know that was a little bit of a, you know, excessive side note there, but it is important for you to know that. So when you oxygenate them only between 88 to 92%. Okay. Another important thing is going to be their annual influenza vaccines, their pneumococcal, pneumococcal vaccinations. You don't want these patients to have any other pulmonary infections and lead to exacerbations. So it's really important that they get their, their, vac their vaccinations, pneumococcal and influenza. Now, go, moving on to the actual medications. So medical management, um, the way you decide upon medication for a patient with COPD is based upon a grading system. It's known as gold scores. So the gold scores are classified into an A, B, or C, uh, A, B, C, or D grading system. And the severity level is based upon their FEV1 results, number of exacerbations, symptom severity, hospitalizations. I'm not going to waste my time explaining each one. It's just a waste of time. You're not going to be tested on it. It's confusing. It's just not worth your time. So I'll list them and briefly just, you know, speak them out loud as we list the severity category so I can tell you which meds fit in both, uh, fit into each one, but absolutely do not waste your time memorizing. It's just ridiculous. All right. So let's get started in medical management. So group A is going to be your, your least severe patient. They're going to be minimally symptomatic, low risk of exacerbation. What are you going to give these patients? Sabas. That's generally all you give them. So your short-acting bronchodilators, albuterol is going to be the one you're most commonly going to hear about. Uh, level butyrol is another one. So group A, minimally symptomatic, low risk of exacerbation, Sabas. That's it. Another thing, you're giving Sabas at group A but you also give it in every other group. It's just in addition to other things. So Saba's across the board. So now group B, more symptomatic, still a low risk of exacerbation. And this is actually how they say it. It's just like not even very specific. This is right from up to date, right from Hippocrates. It's just, that's how it's listed. It's just not worth knowing. So group B, more symptomatic, low risk of exacerbation. Saba's of course, like I said, everybody gets a Saba. And then you're gonna add, you have a choice here, either a Laba or a Lama. So a LABA is a long-acting beta agonist, and then a LAMA is your long-acting muscarinic antagonist. So LAMA, the one you're going to hear about the most, is teotropium. Teotropium is also, uh, the brand name is Spiriva. So that's the name you'll probably be familiar with. So either one. So you give them a SABA, and then you decide whether you're going to give them a LABA or a LAMA. LAMA is going to be a teotropium or Spiriva. And then your LABA is going to be salmeterol, uh, formeterol, 
either one, it doesn't matter. So Saba and then either one of these. So there's kind of, um, llamas are generally uh, preferred because they have a reduced exacerbation rate compared to lavas. But again, you don't have to choose. You can choose either one. So one here and then one here for group B. Group C, minimally symptomatic um, and then high risk of exacerbation. So, I mean, again, look at this. It's just so confusing. Um, so minimal, it's group C, minimally symptomatic and then high risk of exacerbation. That's the key here because this is a low, this is high, still minimally symptomatic here though. Now, Saba's again, and now you don't have a choice anymore. It's not a Laba or a Lama, it's a Lama. So you have to give them a Lama for um, group C. I say you have to, I mean, this is all very, you know, I don't know if these are like 100% rules, but for the sake of your exams and knowing that Lama and Saba for group C. So Saba and Lama, remember, Teotropium or Spiriba. Now group D, this is gonna be your worst. Uh, they're more symptomatic and they're a high risk of exacerbation. These patients, you're gonna give them a Saba, of course, and then you're gonna give them a combo here. You're gonna either give them a Laba plus a Lama combo, or if you're not gonna give them that combo, you have the other option of a Laba plus an inhaled corticosteroid combo. Um, a couple, of, look, one of the ones is named, uh, it's, it's uh, fluticasone with cell metarol. So again, group A, Saba, group B, Saba plus a Lama or a Laba, group C, Saba plus a Lama, and then group D is gonna be Saba plus either a Laba plus Lama, Lama combo, it's like such a tongue twister, or a Laba plus inhaled corticosteroid combo. So this is the medical management you need to know. Um, these are the medications you'll commonly use in these patients, judging by the, the group severity for these patients, the gold um, scores for these patients. So uh, don't you know spend too much time with this, just have a general idea of what med goes you know, where, and they're probably not gonna ask you the groups. They may just, you know, give you like a minimally symptomatic patient, hopefully. All right, so I try to make that as straightforward as I can. It is a little bit much there, but I did my best. Okay, so if a patient has an acute exacerbation, you decide this um, by this um, criteria. So it's, you need two out of the three. And they need uh, increased dyspnea, increased sputum volume, or increased sputum purulence. So really it's just basically, um, you're gonna get this information from the patient because you're not gonna know how severe their dyspnea is, their sputum volume, their sputum purulence. So it's really just kind of what the patient's telling you. So two out of the three, um, you decide they have an acute exacerbation and you treat. So the main way that you treat for um, an acute exacerbation of COPD is gonna be with antibiotics. The one you'll hear most commonly talked about is macrolides like azithromycin because macrolides have not only uh, bactericidal and bacteriostatic effect, but they also have an anti-inflammatory effect in the lungs. So they work really well and they're actually used um, in patients with, with COPD on a chronic low dose basis to prevent ex exacerbations in some patients. So macrolides, you'll probably hear about the most common. Um, fluoroquinolones are also used, clindamycin, but if you're gonna memorize one, I would say just um, memorize your macrolides. A couple other things you can use are bronchodilators. You can use a breathing treatment, which is an albuterol and ipratropium combo. Um, steroids, depending on the severity, PO or IV. But acute exacerbation is the main thing to know is antibiotics. And this, you're deciding that, of course, um, based on their symptoms and the severity and things like that. So that's acute exacerbation. One last miscellaneous topic I wanted to mention because I got this on an exam question and I feel like it's just a miscellaneous thing that you need to know about COPD is that if you see multifocal atrial tachycardia and they say what condition is associated um, with multifocal atrial tachycardia, it is severe COPD. This is very miscellaneous, but you should absolutely know this because I think I actually missed the question on this because I don't think I knew it at the time, but I certainly know it now. So if you see multifocal atrial tachycardia, it asks you, what is it associated with? That's severe COPD, just know that. All right, so that's it. Let's just do five quick questions and we are done. Uh, question one, what is the most common cause overall of both chronic bronchitis and emphysema? Definitely know this one, so smoking. I'm sure that one you probably even knew before PA school. Uh, question two, define chronic bronchitis. Define chronic bronchitis. That is going to be a productive cough for at least three months a year for two consecutive years. Remember, of course, uh, make sure you rule out any other chronic cough causes. Question three, which type of emphysema is seen in patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? I hope you have that visual in your head right now. That was my goal. Hopefully you do. That's going to be panlobular or panacinar. 
Uh, remember that pan with the steak and the A1 sauce pouring over it. Question four, oxygen therapy in a patient with COPD should only be initiated if O2 saturation and PaO2 are at what levels? So if you're going to give a COPD patient oxygen, what levels are you looking for their, for their O2 sat and their PaO2? It's going to be less than or... Um, less than or equal to 88% for their O2 sat, and then their PaO2 you're looking for less than or equal to 55%. Last question, question five, a patient with group D COPD with a high risk of exacerbation, high symptom burden, remember this is your worst class, um, should receive which type of medical management? So I'll give you a second to think about that. Remember your SABAs always, and then your choice of either a LABA plus LAMA combo, LABA plus LAMA combo, or a LABA plus um, an inhaled corticosteroid combo. All right, so that is COPD. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I hope that was helpful. Please leave me a comment if you haven't subscribed yet. Please do. Um, and thank you so much, and good luck on your pants, your pantry, your EORs, and good luck in PA school.